Well, I'm going to get started on my presentation. Um, you can ask questions as we go because we're going to run out of time. Um, I will not be offended if you get up and take a break. And I certainly will not be offended if you go back and talk to Miles about a raffle ticket. Um, so, but what I'm going to try to do is synthesize the, the project that we're working on um, in terms of creating a much clearer description of what we're about, because that's the key part of building a constituency is being clear about what you're about and how, uh, how your product helps the folks that, that you're hoping to join you. Uh, so uh, there were actually two presentations and so you're going to see a transition because uh, the morning presentation was key to setting up this presentation. Uh, but uh, I sat down one day and, and fortunately um, our largest funder one day said uh, to us, you've got to be a lot clearer about what you're doing and, and what progress you expect to have. Um, and that created a, a wonderful period where I had an excuse to really think about what we were doing and how to explain this. And I came up with this spider web as the base for how we build uh, the forward. Because, and frankly, this is a third of our revenue. And they're very clear. They want to take a TGV. And that's what they're about, right? And so he came in and said, what are you doing about getting me a TGV? So I said, well, what does it take to get an high-speed line built and running? And, you know, there's a hundred things we could be working on and a hundred things that we need to be working on and we're just a small staff. So we narrowed it down to what do you have to have in order to have passenger trains work well. And I narrowed it down to these six things and they all interact. So you can't just change one. And for example, um, you need a constituency. And that constituency is engaged by the plan that you're promoting. They also contribute to that plan. But it's hard for the agencies to put together visionary plans if there isn't any money. But the money comes from the plans. And the legislature, again, is motivated to give the money based on what the plan is. And it's all very interrelated. And so how do we impact this process? Um, and we need to focus on one specific area, and that is, if you, I can do this? No, can you hit the next? So that's where our primary focus is, is on a constituency, and building a bigger constituency at all levels for all types of service. And that sets the stage for other things later. Um, but we are doing, because we're in a unique position to think visionary and to be able to step outside the process for a while and think about things in different ways, we do have a piece of the puzzle that we're working on each of these. So on the legislature, this, this past week, um, the key Republicans in um, Illinois and Indiana, and the reason we've, I, we ran out of time on, on those two states, but we would have kept going if we had more staff. We sent a personalized email to every member on our email list that is in a Republican district that has an Amtrak station in those two cities, saying, today you need to call. Um, and we did get responses that people called and that, that their, their calls got through. We also got uh, with Peter Roskam people getting, I'm sorry, the mailbox is full. But, and then we also, you heard from Dave Winters, who's working directly with the legislature down in, in Springfield. Um, in terms of funding, we are starting to the process, and I'll talk to you about this later, about how you actually could finance this. And people know that, there are experts out there, but it's not in a digestible form, and I don't understand it. So we are spending time right now understanding how you would finance those key pieces of infrastructure that you need to make to make high, really super high frequency work. Um, on the agencies, um, again, that's primarily just building a constituency so that the agencies have money in order to staff up. Um, but this bill that we have with the authority is causing a conversation. Maybe the authority isn't the right way to go. There are a lot of advantages to it and there's disadvantages. But that's a way of having a conversation about how that structure actually works. The executable plan. Um, is again something we can think bigger term and I'll talk at the end about the ex plan that we don't think we're going to have the plan 
right? But we can start a different conversation and we can have an idea of what a different kind of plan would be. And we're also very engaged in an FRA study to create a master vision for the Midwest. So that's very exciting. And then the last is, the one piece everybody forgets, is you have to have a railroad, right? And, um, and when I mean a railroad, in this case, I don't mean tracks. I mean a corporate entity with the special powers that a railroad has. Um, and here in Illinois, um, you have an agency, th th you have two entities that go by the name of Metro. One is the Commuter Rail Board, and that's the government entity um, that manages the public issues around running a commuter rail service. You also have the Northeastern Illinois Passenger Rail Corporation, which is a publicly owned railroad. And in the cases where Metro is operating its services directly, it's that railroad that's doing those. Um, and that's just a piece, it was a revelation, you gotta figure out what the railroad piece of it is in order to move forward. Um, so those again is on if you go to the next one, uh, this was right, so the appropriators. So the dark red is the FUD committee, um, the lighter red is the appropriations committee in our region, uh, the dark green is TNI committee, uh, I'm sorry, is railroad subcommittee of the TNI committee and the lighter green is TNI committee. Uh, if you switch now. And trying to describe a challenge that has been very difficult to get through. And we've been framing the question wrong. Uh, we have frequently framed the question between whether you fix what you have and improve what you have or you build new track, right? The problem is neither really works without doing the other, and I'll describe why later. But um, I stumbled upon this picture that I think sums it up well of a TGV train that is either going to, I'm not sure, to or from Geneva, uh, from Paris, and it's going alongside what looks to me like a coal train. Um, and so what is frequently missed is though because that piece of infrastructure that you build allows you to create a completely different type of service that looks different to the user, it really is still just a train running on track, and those trains don't have to just go on the high-speed track, they can go in lots of other places. And um, that was very difficult to talk about in the United States because of our outdated safety regulations on trains. Um, the FRA had put in new safety regulations and a proposed rulemaking. Unfortunately, the current administration has put uh, a hold on that temporarily. Um, as part of their no new regulations. But the fact that um, there are a couple of designs out there that have been approved by the FRA under the new safer regulations that are based on Europe. You've got the um, uh, train for Tex rail that will go between uh, Fort Worth and Dallas Fort Worth Airport. You've got the Stadler commuter cars that were part of Metro Electric or Caltrain electrification, and then uh, the new Acela sets. Next. So one of our challenges, that's one way that our constituency gets split up in a way that's unproductive. There's another way that our constituency gets, it gets it split up in a way that's very unproductive. This is the highway program. So if you want a federal, this is how policy is set for a federal aid highway, right? You've got, and I've got it backwards, but you've got the TNI committee, and I forgot what the Senate committee is, and their subcommittees. They go through the Federal Highway Administration to a state DOT. The state legislature provides funds and policy to the state DOT. And then whoever's building that highway builds it. It's a little bit more complicated, but I'm trying to make a point that you're going to see later. Um, and then um, the actual user pays for the vehicle, right? Now we go to the next one. This makes our job a lot harder. That's policy for if you want to build a railroad. Right? So the railroad that runs between Union Station and Aurora is owned by a private company that does not have stakeholders, shareholders, it's a private company. Um, it has on it Metro passenger trains, which are funded through Metro, the commuter rail board, and through the state. The federal funds come through the FTA, um, and the policy around that is set by the Railroad Subcommittee of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. 
Um, and then Amtrak is in a different, if the route, so that's primarily, those monies are primarily for business trips, or I'm sorry, trips to work, right? Now, if you've got a long distance, and in this case, we're using a European definition of long distance, so anything that's outside of the metropolitan area. A long distance trip under 750 miles is controlled by the states, and then the long distance over 750 miles is controlled directly through Amtrak, and they're all sharing the same track, and it's very capital intensive, so how do you split how that cost structure works, right? That's one frustrating piece. Another frustrating piece is it's hard in this context to think about bundling markets because you risk, if you're talking about a long distance route um, and you're doing an EIS on a long distance route or you're doing a project on a long distance route and you wanna talk about how you're gonna serve work trips in the, inter, in the inter, uh, intermediate stations, you risk suddenly becoming part of the FTA process and now you've got two agencies. So it becomes very hard to bundle the constituencies the way you need to. And we're not going to ever change this process, but we can figure out a way to communicate this in a way that people can start to see themselves as friends. Um, and our first step in doing that was the Crossrail project, which we talked about last year. Next. Um, so as again, I said, you know, one of our primary funder is very interested in high-speed rail. We were founded with the premise that if these three routes on the day that we started were less than two and a half hours and they're about the same distance as major pairs in uh, the Midwest, why can't we have it here? That's basically our funding promise, pro uh, prospect. Next. Um, and you see, once you get to a critical threshold of under three hours, the ridership really takes off. Um, and that's for uh, one reason is because a three-hour trip is the point at which you can go out and back in a day. That's one reason. Now you're clearly competitive with the car. There's a bunch of issues there. But how do you get there is the hard part. Because as Tim mentioned earlier, on the highway side, you can do segments. You can fix segments of highway and there's the rest of the network there. But we let our network go. And it's hard to talk about those expensive key segments without the rest of the network. And it's hard to make the rest of the network work without that key segment. Next. So initially, it's easy to talk about city pairs because everybody thinks about the city pair that they're traveling. They don't really care about the network that that city pair is under. And maybe they recognize there's some stops on the trip. So planning typically, because the highway is just looking at segments, the highway planners are just looking at segments, and plus you're thinking politically, most people are only thinking about their, their trip. You think in planning around routes. And in this case, on the left-hand left -hand side, we simplified this because part of the issues with networks is it gets com more complex and you have more opportunity for more people to ride the more complex the network is. So we have to really simplify the networks to make the point. So in this case, we've got two major points with a point in the middle. There's three opportunities to take this network next. And on the left-hand side is a study that we did with high-speed rail. So if you can get that trip down under to two and a half hours with true high-speed rail, this is what happens. The Amtrak on Chicago to St. Louis is the blue. Um, the, the 110 projections are in yellow with the five trips a day that are there today and 10. And then the projections for what high-speed rail would be like in 2035 with, uh, if that was there. So it is a significant thing. But one point is it's very difficult to justify building that new infrastructure for just 16 or 20 trains a day. You've got to figure out how to put a lot more trains on that track. Next. So if you start looking at the network instead of just that route, it starts to look differently. So in this case, we're taking that initial idea of Chicago to St. Louis and we're making it bigger by having trains feed in and by having different types of trains on that track serving different markets. Um, and you can do this in most directions. Um, and the reason we focus on this is because of the fact that we are, um, uh, have had the most luck in, in Illinois um, and we have a governor that really wants to figure out how to move the University of Illinois to Chicago. And it's easier to do that with a high-speed train than it is to pick all those buildings up and move them up here. Um, and the key infrastructure is in Chicago, which is mm -hmm. in Illinois. But you can do this to the east just as well. You can have the similar kind of funnel in from the east and from the north. Um, 
And we're, this is the structure that we're trying to learn how you finance these things and how the governance structure works and all of that so that we can start to build a constituency. Next. So this is, a, I told you we're working on a paper and a project or a, a program around the website and communications. We haven't figured out a good diagram to explain frequency yet. But uh, Mark helped today in des describing what the issues are. We need a diagram, but frequency is the first thing as we talked about, right? Next. Um, speed really does increase the size of the market. So what we're talking about is you're taking this piece of really expensive infrastructure and how do you expand the market? Well, um, in terms of this, the size that you can go around a station and attract people from the station, gets bigger as the train gets faster. Um, and not based on anything other than speed track and serve as wide an area as the possible. So in this, that first picture was a train going off on the, the conventional network. This isn't the way they actually started high speed rail in France. This was their plan high speed rail in France. And you can see all these lines feeding into a new high speed line that didn't go from Lyon to Paris. It went from the suburbs of Lyon to the suburbs of Paris, right? The interesting thing we discovered in this, I've been using this for 10 years as the example of how they started it. We learned they, did, they only had like half of this the first day. So it's just from that junction point so it didn't even go all the way up to Paris. Just that first junction point as you head south from Paris into Lyon was where they first initially had a new high-speed line when they started service. So, so that's in that map. That's of those yellow lines coming in. Next one. And now you've got this really complex PDV network that's using a lot of different things in different places. The, the next, next is you have to stop and pick, pick, pick people up, not just for, in terms of building market, for political reasons as well. The challenge here, again, in our sampled network, um, you've got a lot more opportunities for people to get on in Purple City if there's lots of stops, right? But how do you balance the travel time um, stopping a lot versus the need to make these stops? Very small towns support to make it happen. So the best example of cramming a lot of trains right so they have a 300 mile often as the red line does here in Chicago um, and twice an hour they have a train that makes every single stop and this is Chicago to Detroit look how many are on that line, the same distance as Chicago to Detroit. Um, the red ones leave, depending upon the time of day, every three to five minutes, or sometimes every 10 to 15 minutes. But those are the highest priced and the fastest trains. Um, and then you've got blue in the middle that kind of fits that mix in the middle. Um, in this case, because that infrastructure is so, it's only a two-track railroad, and each station has passing loops, so the, the local trains get overtaken in the stations. Um, in order to make that work on a two-track railroad, every train has to perform exactly the same. So every train is the same. Now you've got one that's a slightly newer version on the left than the other, and it's able to go a little bit faster than the one on the right, but they all run at the same level. Next. So um, we've got a challenge here in that it might not be feasible to build a train set that can withstand the stresses of running on heavy haul rough track and also be stiff enough to run a 200 miles an hour plus. We don't, I don't know that yet. That's a question that I have. Um, uh, we know that we'll be able to get to 150 because the cell is doing that now um, and they're pr pr planning on 160. But Spain has a challenge in that they actually have different gauge track and so their trains, their trucks aren't stiff enough that can go on the old network to also run at 200 miles an hour because they have to change gauge um, in order to go on the old track and the new track. So this leads how this might work here where we have three different levels of service. The very high speed trains that stay on the high speed track going out over 200 miles an hour. The gauge changing trains that go on both. And then high speed commuter trains, they add another layer to this um, in terms of high speed commuter trains that are subsidized as commuter trains. Next. 
Um, so that's the network when they started with the different levels of service. Go quickly through. Um, and then how it develops over time. Next. And then the next is to build a grid. And this is the last piece, uh, I'm sorry, the last second to last. So we've got a hub and spoke, but we've actually got a lot of people going in different places, not just into Chicago. Um, so that gives you, if you have connecting points, that gives you an opportunity for more people to take the train again because they're connecting from train to train. And the best example of that is Germany. Um, next one. Um, where they've added small sections of high-speed rail. And for the most part, they've limited themselves to 150 miles an hour um, on those new sections. But there's this complex network that they have because they don't have a center node um, of trains going out of places. And if you look at the next one, this is that in a transit network. And I know it's hard to see, but you can download it off the DB website. They basically have a subway map for their, their high-speed system. And the key routes run every hour on the same, and they connect at all these stations. So you know you can connect from one to the other um, every hour. Next. And then the last piece is having a, pe having a train that's incredibly flexible to do a lot of things. And again, DB does that very well with this train set, which is just uh, got an was introduced into service in September, where it can do any of their services except for this, the very high speed. Um, they're going to have this in all services, the same train set. Sometimes it will be on a line that's only going 80 miles the whole time. Sometimes it'll be on a route that's going 150. But that flexibility gives them the opportunity to move it all around the place. And it has a much lower cost and a much higher expectation for the customer. And I want to point out that they have really good food on these trains. Um, and we should have that, right? But one of the things you have to do to have really good food is they have much higher volume in order to, to make it doable. Next. Um, so the first piece of this is Crossrail, and um, we're running late, so I want to point out this is about building constituencies, mm -hmm. right? Our mayor really wants an express train from the Loop to O'Hare. I don't think the numbers work out if it's just those trains. It becomes easier in my mind if you combine it with a transit service and access point for other trains going in there. Um, he also really cares about things like the Pullman National Museum and the Obama Library um, and U of I and uh, U of C, all of these things that are on the Metro Electric. So if you could tie those together and take Metro Electric, which was built to be expandable to high-speed rail when it was built in the 20s, if you could modernize it, run much more frequent transit service, coordinate it with the bus services, you drive a lot more volume um, to uh, PACE and CTA buses, um, and you make that system work and you connect it to O'Hare and suddenly you've got a cross-county transit network. And that's why the county has been uh, very progressive in looking at Metro Electric and, and eventually Crossrail. Uh, next. And then the next piece is you do have to build high-speed segments, segments going through. Um, and one of those, the, from a business case, that makes a lot of sense because Indianapolis is so much closer would be Indianapolis. Um, there's also, you know, going out to the east um, along the lake would be another key place that, that would make a lot of sense. And going up to Milwaukee is the first leg of improving service to Wisconsin and, and Minneapolis. Um, but now, in my opinion, and we haven't done the numbers on this, but in my opinion, if you do both at the same time, if you run more frequent service on the Cardinal route via Cardinalsville, if you upgrade the existing route for much more frequent, not the existing route, the straighter route for much more frequent service to Cincinnati at the same time, um, both of them become much more viable much more quickly. If you do it at the same time, you do high-speed rail. And again, I don't know that. We haven't done the numbers. But that's our goal, is to ask this question and get an answer to it next. Um, and then that starts to build out from there in terms of adding segments piece by piece by piece. So, um, so what we are attempting to do now is something um, a test case. We're not the ones who are going to actually do the actual work that proves the case. Our goal is just to get it far enough that 
the legislators say we're going to spend the money to do the bigger study but we're trying to raise the funds to do this basic case to figure out if this network really works the way we think it will and where the first segments make sense to be I don't know where they are I don't know if it works but we're trying to put together this business plan to, to figure out of this and this becomes the core of how we advocate because we've got in our single program we improve transit for Chicago and Cook County we improve the bus network we give um, um, high ticket users of a perpetual airport express train from the loop to O'Hare something we um, help rural America significantly because we bring them much closer together into the bigger cities wrapped up into a program if we can just figure out how to communicate um, and figure out how it's phased and financed and those are the two challenges so we've got um, a, one quote to do this and I was um, I'm, I'm happy to think that this is a very valuable project at this price but it's a little bit bigger than I'm used to talking about in terms of our funding given that we've been three hundred thousand dollars for the last several years but it's significantly more than our annual budget um, but we think we can have the access to the right people in order to put that together in order to start this process um, and again it can happen in different directions depending upon who's interested um, in being a part of that that program um, I don't remember I have anything underneath um, so um, that kind of wraps it up and just as a fun note I was on a train going 186 miles an hour and we were pacing this train for about 10 minutes this is between Nanjing and, and uh, Nanjing and actually Shanghai and Nanjing so if there's any